Welcome back, Happy Fabricators. In this video, we're gonna do something a little different. I had a buddy of mine come over, and he said, I want you to teach me how to TIG weld. So we decided to throw the camera up and make it something that hopefully you can learn from as well. Now, I'm editing this video right now, and I can say that I have already learned something from this video and this experience. The first and foremost thing is I definitely need to come up with an order and a curriculum of sorts when I'm teaching people in person. Making a video is different. You can lock down a topic and teach and communicate that topic. But when you got somebody in front of you, what I learned is I need to sit down and write down an order of these specific things so that I'm not backtracking or confusing the student. So hopefully you guys learn as much from this video as I did. So sit down, enjoy, and then go build something. Okay, welcome back guys. Today we're gonna do something a little different. I have my friend Joe here. What's your welding experience? Have you TIG welded at all before? Um, so I have a lot of MIG welding experience, not a whole lot of TIG welding experience. Okay. So have you picked a torch up at all before? Or I have picked up a torch before, um, again, like I said, but not but a whole lot little. of training with TIG, Fair a lot enough. of MIG stuff. Fair enough. So I guess today we're going to go through and just kind of have an outside perspective. Joe's going to ask questions that I probably wouldn't normally think of because it's stuff that I already know. So hopefully this can be valuable for you guys and we can all learn something from it. So to start off with, what Joe's projects are coming up is stainless. So we're going to start them off on a hard one and run through some stainless. It's not normally what I recommend starting on, but he's down for the challenge. Okay, so first off, we're going to set up our torch and all the consumables are in here the correct way and we want to set our tungsten stick out. The general rule of thumb is you want your tungsten to not stick out any further than the diameter of this orifice. A good way that I like to just set it up quick and easy is I like to have my tungsten loose in there, come down and I just hold it at about a 45 degree angle and then I tighten the collet up. You just do these guys thumb tight because if you crank down on it, you'll ruin the collet that's in there. So the next thing we need is our rod. When you're holding this guy, I definitely recommend if you get some, practice at home with one of the ways that you don't have to move your hand. I use this method. Okay. To start off with, you can do this and dab it in, do what you're comfortable with. But for long term, I definitely recommend some people do it like this, some people do it like this, some people do it like this. But have you seen those little roller feeders? I have. I've personally they... not tried one. Okay. That was gonna be my next question. But yeah. <laughs> no, that's a good question. I should get one and try it. Your hand. The reason I recommend that is it allows you to plant forward of your wrist for rest, and you can dial that rod down in the right spot. Because if you're out here, you're having to control like four joints, yeah. and you're just like if you're trying to get in this hole, you're just not gonna be as precision as if you can plant forward of that wrist. And you can sit there and do that. Oh. Okay, so we're gonna set the machine up. We're doing, we'll start them out on some 10 gauge or roughly eighth inch material. So the general rule of thumb is one amp per thousandth of an inch. So this is 120 thousandths. So I'm gonna set you up um, with 120 amps on the machine. Now you probably will not need all of that. We have a pedal here and this allows, works as a potentiometer allows you to get a variable amperage out of the pedal. So when I'm set at 120 amps on the machine, you're gonna get anywhere progressively from zero to 120 amps from here to full pedal. Okay. If I set it at 60 amps, you'd get zero to 60 amps from full pedal. And so with stainless, you usually use a little less than that general rule of thumb. So you're probably gonna be at like the two thirds of the pedal range. So Weldon. then that brings me back to just a basic question yeah. since, like I said, I, I know MIG fairly well, which is point and pull. Mm -hmm. There's no pedal involved. Um, how do you balance out or where do you know how to balance where, where you should have the pedal as you're moving? Where you should have that? Um, just practice? Definitely practice. There are certain things that you'll see. So if you're too cold, you won't get your pedal to form as easily and maybe your rod won't wet out into the material as easily. Okay. And if you're too hot, you're going to wet out too much and you might even get a crater on the outsides of your weld. And then for your own personal preference, because I've heard it a different, couple mm -hmm. different ways, do you prefer to pull your weld or to push it? Uh, with TIG welding, you almost always have to push it. So 
The preferred position is people say 15 degrees. So if you're straight here, you go over about 15 degrees. If you're on a flat joint like this, you want to be 90 degrees to the joint. So I would, if you're going that way, you're about that angle and you're going to be pushing that weld as you're drawing into it. If you're at a, doing a uh, fillet weld, you want to be 45 degrees to this joint. So you want this torch to be 45 degrees right in between this and then a 15 degree lead. Okay. So you're 45 degrees between this material and this material and then 15 degrees this way and as you travel coming towards forward. You. Yeah. So usually, are you, you're right handed. Correct? I'm right handed. Okay. So see, and that's where I guess I would be confused mm -hmm. is coming towards you is a push. I would think going away from you is a push. Uh, the push has to do with the angle of your electrode. Gotcha. So you can have a push coming towards you or coming away from you. So, and a lot of times, so you're talking about the push is the angle of the, the electrode, electrode to the bead itself. Correct. Okay. Correct. So if I'm going this direction, with we're pushing the, it. I'm pushing it, but way. I could still be gotcha. going this direction okay. and pulling it. See, and, and that's where I would have thought the complete opposite is pushing is going away from you. Correct. Pulling okay. is coming towards no, you regardless of. See, that's why this is great. Questions that I wouldn't think of. Um, yes, exactly. So it has to do with the direction of the electrode and okay. same with their MIG welder. Yep. So like the direction of your electrode, you're gonna be pushing it and you can have it go the same direction, but. So regarding the pedal, like I was saying, whatever we set our machine to, that's going to be the full extent of the pedal can do. Mm -hmm. So if I set this to 120, 50% of the pedal is going to be 60 amps. If I set this to 60 amps, I'm not going to get 60 amps unless I romp all the way down on it. I prefer personally to go just a little bit higher than the standard rule of thumb because just with the experience, um, if you are welding on materials that have inconsistent thicknesses or whatever, it just gives me options so in the middle of the weld i can change the temperature well it makes sense to me as a newbie mm -hmm. because if you have room for more you can always back off but if you ha don't have the room you can't add more mid this is true mid bead so the downside to the where that comes with uh, a lot of newer people that are welding is it makes that sweet spot because when you're welding that perfect amp or that perfect weld is going to be within like a five amp range five to ten amps and so <clears throat> the higher the broader you have that range, the more minute movement is going to affect that. Okay. So, till you feel it out. So, we'll start out with 120 max, and then since this is stainless, you're gonna be using less than that anyways. Okay, so as far as distance goes, um, ideal distance is as close as you can to from your tungsten to the puddle without touching it. Okay. I'm gonna say, for mild steel and stainless, it'd be good to shoot for like a sixteenth of an inch. But another thing that's gonna affect it is as you put your rod in, the size of that puddle is gonna increase because you're increasing the mass of that puddle as you dab that rod in. Um, you wanna dab that rod like in between the edge of the puddle and your tungsten. Yeah, you wanna keep that motion and that's gonna do a couple things. That's gonna give you consistency of the bead. And then also that's gonna help you keep those temperatures down. Cause as you proceed stainless, the key to stainless is actually your travel speed. The faster you get at it, the better you'll get at it. Because uh, another misconception is higher amps equals higher temperatures. And that's not necessarily true. Temperature is equivalent to time spent. So I could turn this thing up to 120 amps and do a bead and I'm gonna get that bead up to a specific size faster with less heat input. Whereas if I have it turned way down, I'm gonna have to sit there and wait around for that bead to get up to the right size. And in the process, it's gonna heat soak that piece a lot more. So if you can get your travel speed down faster, what that's doing is that's introducing more raw material that hasn't been heat soaked yet into that puddle mm -hmm. and cooling it down as it goes. Okay. And then also this your raw material, your rod going into it is going to cool it down too. So you can shove that rod in there and that's going to cool your puddle down. So you have three main things that are going to affect the temperature of your puddle. Uh, your pedal position, how much rod and how fast you're sticking it in and how fast your travel speed is. Because if you think your rod, like 
think of a boiling pot of water and you dump just a little cup of cold water in it and it just and it changes that temperature of the whole thing at that point you're going to want to try to find that edge point and if you're getting too warm you can do a couple things you can lightly back off the pedal you can add more rod or you can start moving faster all of those things will bring the temperature of that puddle down so to start off with what i'm going to recommend is sometimes you can't see very well how far away that tungsten is so come down and actually touch it to your workpiece and then lift off because then you can physically feel where it's at mm. if there's crud on your helmet or you have a forked perspective for the angle and a shadow or whatever um, sometimes it can fool you so if you just go down and touch it lift off a sixteenth of an inch and then we're going to roll into our pedal and what i like to call is kind of flashlight mode you just barely strike that arc enough that you can see through your helmet but you're not actually like melting anything and then once you see and establish where you're at we're going to roll on that pedal a little more and then let that pedal let the puddle get to the correct size and then we'll proceed forward adding rod and moving forward okay. so general rule of thumb for your puddle size is the diameter of your thickest material well technically your thinnest material so this is eighth inch material so shoot for having your puddle width roughly an eighth of an inch all the way down slowly roll the pedal There you go. Now you can see where you're at. Now put some more pedal into it until you get a puddle for me. Don't add that rod yet. Get that puddle a little brighter. A little more, a little more. See the puddle forming down below? Yep. Get that to an eighth of an inch wide. There you go. Now add your rod. Now pull it out. There you go. So dab, move forward, dab, move forward. Dab, move forward. Try to think of a song or a rhythm. There you go. So how do you keep your puddle straight? Because I feel like I'm veering off here. So go ahead and stop for a second. Oh, oh. So make sure to let off that pedal before you lift that arc away there. One way that I'll keep myself straight is I'll use my rest on like the edge of the table. And so I'll like do this. I can move my material to here and I can like slide okay or or you can just do a dry run and pivot just kind of like feel it out you can see right in here that was looking really good and then what you were starting to do at the end was it started pulling away pulling the long, yeah we call it long arc in it and so you were pulling away from it and what that does is the further your arc kind of makes a cone shape if you notice that cone and you want to be in that sweet spot where you're t in more of the apex of the cone. So your arc is more centered on the material. The further you pull that away, that arc spreads out and you then need more amperage to compensate for it because it's got to jump a larger gap yep. basically. And it's not going to be as precision and kind of tight down the okay. way you'd like it. So, your long arc in a little bit, tighten that arc up a little bit. There you go. Now give it more amperage until that puddle gets a little bit wider. More amperage, more amperage. Now get that rod in there. There we go. More amperage, more amperage. See how that puddle's kind of not Yeah, it's moving on me. Not even moving, it's not wetting out flat. There you go. That's looking better. There you go. Getting that rhythm down. You're right. Like if you can put like a tune or a rhythm in your head. Yeah, just one, two, three. There you go. Oh, oh. and I stuck the tungsten. That's okay. We all do it. So you can see how when you started out here, uh, the puddle wasn't, it was kind of, has more of a crown to it and a profile. Yeah. And then when you got in here, this is like the perfect heat range. I mean, this whole thing from there to there is great. You kind of got to that profile where that puddle started to wet out. You got in time dabbing and that looks really good. The only thing that I would say you could improve on with that is um, you don't want that 
rod to kind of reside in there. If you can, get it in. Get it out. And then get it out. Okay. So get it in, let it wet out, get it out. Get it in. That, I mean, you don't have to pull it this far away. I'm just yeah. shooting for extremes. But you want to pull it out of that arc zone. Okay. Because what will happen is if it's not quite in there enough to melt into your puddle, there still could, it could be close enough that right at the end of your rod right here, it'll melt off and that little bit that melts, it'll create a little ball on the end of your rod, but it won't go into the puddle. And that ball is more than likely not in that gas shielded zone. Gotcha. And so you'll contaminate that ball that's on the end of the rod and then you go to dip it right back in the next time and you just dip contaminated material into that puddle. Just like an instrument, your right hand is at a normal time and this, this is your, like your percussion. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, and oftentimes I find that I weld better with music in. Like, because you can just pick up on that rhythm and go for it. Yeah. And if you can get that timing down, that's what's going like to help This just you. stays at a constant and this is like your... Correct. Every once in a while, if you hit a hiccup and maybe your dab didn't quite, you missed your dab slightly and didn't quite sink in, you've got to slow that feed rate down a little bit to catch up. Because what I'm looking at when I'm welding is how far I'm wetting out the toes of the weld. So what your toes are, are the sides of the weld here. Okay. And so looking at the leading edge, so I know where to dab that next rod into. And then I'm also looking at the width of it so that when I put that dab in, it's filling it out to the width of my previous speed so gotcha. that I get a consistent as possible uh, weld all the way across. So you can do that by your travel speed, those three things we talked about, mm -hmm. travel speed, adding rod, or you're regulating the pedal, okay. bringing those to that correct width. So go ahead and do another one on the eighth inch here. Let me turn the machine back on for you. So like right there? Yep, more heat, more pedal. Get that puddle to the width an eighth inch wide, more heat, more heat. Set your torch up straighter. Torch up straighter, that's the size of your puddle. You now feed your rod. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. And way to get it out of there and get it back in. Perfect. And another thing with stainless is, so see how that was red hot there? Yeah. You want it, it's called our post flow. And you want to hold that on there afterwards because if you just break it off, you have that molten material that is above that temperature range that can suck that atmosphere in. Gotcha. And so that's what, uh, it's called post flow is when it runs after you're done welding. So you wanna stop welding and hold that over it for a certain amount of time. That looks really good. Now, there's gray in there. It's all still got a sheen over it. Still, it's not flat or matte. And part of the reason is with stainless, that post flow, you have a certain amount of trailing gas uh, that you want to shield it, and you have a smaller nozzle here. Whereas, that, like that big FUPA 12 cup that I had on mm -hmm. earlier, that gives me more of a trailing shield. Gotcha. I don't usually run that when I'm teaching people to begin with because you have to run like twice as a much gas. gas, and when you're just practicing, there's not really any use to it. Yeah. You don't. It doesn't give you any benefit of learning. Oh, and the other thing is, so now that you've kind of started seeing what that puddle looks like with stainless you want to try to get up to that puddle size strike the arc like you're doing perfectly so you can see where your tungsten's at and then you want to try to get up to that puddle diameter as fast as you can after you gotcha. establish that arc because if you're just sitting there slowly going the whole time you're doing that you're heat soaking that part okay so you want to be able to get up to that puddle size and then start moving okay if you're welding aluminum that's the exact opposite. Aluminum, you actually want to ramp up really slowly like you're doing and clean those oxides off the surface, which is a little different. We'll do that another day. <laughs> but um, with stainless, you want to just strike it and establish where that tungsten is, make sure you're in the right spot, welding in the right spot, and then get up to that puddle diameter as fast as possible. Okay. So, did you see? I lost. Yeah, exactly. So you got up to that spot, and then you lost the rhythm on your dab. Yeah. And so that's where I was saying that sometimes you got to hold up that travel speed enough and watch 
the sides of your puzzle huddle to make sure you're filling it out. So you might have to hold up just a little bit, shove that rod in there as fast as possible, and then you can proceed forward. Angle still so, 45 or come a little more upwards? Whatever the degrees. So there's two things with this one. Actually, we're putting a piece of 16 gauge to a piece of eighth inch material. So we have a lighter material here. So you want to slightly air your electrode towards the thicker material. Okay. So if these were both the same thickness, uh, not uh, worrying about the degrees, you just want to split the difference. Okay. But since this one is slightly thicker, you'd want to be pointing a little more towards the thicker one. Okay. Now, this and is And you're the, talking the tip of the electrode more towards, correct. so I the, want to be more upright than Correct, okay. the direction of the electrode. Where this might be different is you have to think, you just made a weld on this piece, so that thicker piece is actually going to be warm already. Okay. So in that case, you might be right back to not having to compensate for that and right in the middle. And again, that's just something that comes with practice and doing it a bunch, right? Yeah, like, so what I would shoot for is start right in the middle, and then if it feels like it's not wetting out down into thicker material, adjust that arc angle and tip it up just a little more so you're pointed at the thicker stuff. Okay. Okay, so overall for, what was that, 20 minutes of practice? That was not bad at all. I've seen so much worse. And in fact, I was so much worse when I first started. When I started, all of my welds looked like this. So I would say the first two days, all just my welds looked like this. First glance here, what did I do? Obviously too much heat, mm -hmm. but why is this weld flat compared to like a ridged bead? What made it flatten out so much? Is that the heat expansion from too much heat or? Um, combination of all of those okay. three things. So combination of too slow a travel speed, too much amperage, and not enough filler rod. Okay. So it goes back to those three variables and the combination of all of those lead into it. So as a brand new person, obviously to TIG, uh, the pedal is a new thing for me because that doesn't exist in the MIG world. Yep. Um, so outside of the pedal, it comes down to having a bead like this is travel speed and a consistent dab. Obviously the pedal has to play in with that, but I mean, just as far as consistency of bead width and Correct. pedal size. Correct, because you can weld with a lift arc. You I mean, you can do this exact same thing with a lift arc or a scratch start and you don't have a pedal, you're just setting your amperage. Mm -hmm. And that, when you're doing that, the only two ways you have to control the heat that you're inputting into that is your travel speed and how much filler rod you're putting in. Okay. So the consistency of that and the travel speed that you are using per your material thickness and type and all that is your primary ones. Having a pedal is just an extra perk because it allows you some more finite adjustment on the run. Like you did earlier, you missed your beat and didn't quite get that dab in there. Yep, and you can see that right there. Exactly. I completely missed my... That pedal allows you to back off that pedal for a half a second to get that more rot rod in there. Whereas if you didn't have the pedal, you're stuck at that amperage and you just got to keep hauling and maybe you just got to try to get two dabs in a second instead of one dab in a second. And then this one over here, it was a matter of... I had reached what I felt comfortable oh, yep. with dabbing and I needed to pull more rod out. Exactly. And I didn't have that flow. And like that you goes said. back to so what I recommend. See the gap of, oh my God, where'd the rod go? Exactly. <laughs> and that goes back to what I recommend learning one of those ways to feed rod. And I have a video, if you guys can look that up and I can link it up here to those different methods and how to go about those methods. There's multiple different ones. It comes down to what you're comfortable with. So I would say well fitting gloves. Yes. Uh, is a big thing. Obviously, I'm, they I'm borrowing help. yours, so yeah. they're, and they're a little, used. I'm little sorry, large they're on my hands. But I think well-fitting gloves would definitely help with that because I could definitely just do it right here. That feels more comfortable than trying to, and then backing up off it to re-grab while the hood's exactly. on. Exactly. Um, and when you get good enough, that allows you to make a bead that is the length, infinitely long or the length of your filler rod without stopping. As long as you can continue that yeah. profile around whatever, whatever you're comfortable with, but it allows you to not have to like stop and you're either burning your glove or you're getting too close, but yeah, definitely recommend that. So I want to thank Joe for hanging out today and letting me use him as the guinea pig to do some teaching. If you guys want to see more fabrication content, click some of the links that are going to pop up here. If you had any questions or ways that you think that I can improve on my teaching or 
any input for Joe, leave that down in the comments. If you want to be notified of upcoming content, click that subscribe button and go build something, guys.